Hello, everybody. Hello, I hope people can hear me. I am excited to be live on Oakland Zoo's Facebook page. This is Amy, VP of Conservation, welcoming you. Stick around with us, settle in. I have a message for you right here. It's very important. If you want to drink whiskey and save monkeys, stay with us. Hello. Again, it's Amy. I'm VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. It's been a wild day in the Bay Area of red skies and darkness. So let's get together, have a little light, a little hope, a little laughs, a little drink, a little monkey saving. Um, that is what we're going to be doing. All right, good to see people hopping on. All right, Whew. what a day, what a day, what is up? All right, what a joy, despite everything, what a joy it is to share this world with wildlife. Whew. Um, we have to learn to share, clearly. Um, we have to share resources, we have to share space, we have to share food, we have to share shelter, um, and it is not always easy. But once in a while there is an organization, there's a project that just does it so well in such an inspiring way that we just need to talk about it. And Proyecto TD is one of those. So I'm so excited about our guest today. Our guest is going to be amazing. Um, I can't believe it. And she's from far away where there's blue skies. What is that? Um, we're gonna be traveling together today. Do you remember that? Traveling. We're going to go to beautiful Colombia, one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. And we're gonna be learning about the cutest and very most endangered little monkey, the cotton top tamarind. This guy. Um, we're also gonna be having a drink. That's because you are watching Cocktails and Conservation. You're watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife conservation leaders from around the planet. Hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help them. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to taking action for wildlife. All right, welcome back, welcome back to Cocktails and Conservation, where we meet with people from all over the world, um, wildlife heroes, who have incredible stories. We're gonna to get to listen to those stories in a virtual but fun and casual way. We're gonna hear about their solutions and we're gonna to get to be part of their solutions. So if you hang out with us today, not only are you gonna drink whiskey and save monkeys, um, but you're gonna, you're just gonna feel so good like it did something good today despite what's going on in the world and in our skies, you're gonna feel really good. So I'm so glad you're here. Stick around with us. I'm your host, I'm Amy, I'm the Vice President of Conservation at Oakland Zoo, where we believe that we can all do something to help animals in the wild. And we used to get together in, big, in a lecture hall and squash all in, and we miss those days, but this is our way of doing that safely, um, in a fun way, and in a way that we can still gather, still create community, still support a project, still have a good time, and on top of that, we are helping restaurants and bars in this area um, support them and give them a voice. That's where the cocktail comes in. So it's wonderful. So we like to pretend, um, why not? We like to pretend we're somewhere beautiful, especially today. So this time we're gonna pretend we're, we're here. We're at this <laughs> travel lodge called Tamarind in Colombia, um, we're hanging out by the pool. I think I'm in the pool and we're, we're just gonna have that cocktail, um, hang out and along comes this like superstar Colombian wildlife saver who hangs out with us for about an hour or so and drinks with us and talks about what she does and her dreams and tells us all about monkeys. So that's a pretty good way to spend some time. So if you're down for that in the chats when you're here, um, can you make a cotton top tamarind chirp or twirt 
or tweet or chip or whatever sound you think they make, let's hear it. What do you think that they make? Hmm, uh, whistle? All right, so let's see. Um, while we're pretending we're at that bar, if you wanna get going, I think the recipe to the tamarind teeny made by Savage and Cook Distillery in Vallejo, California, um, it's gonna be in the chat. So you can jump right on there, get your cocktail going. Um, don't wait for us, um, just go ahead and get it in there. It's gonna be good, delish. All right, so here's your question of the day before we move further. It's a hard question this time. Here's the question. Name a species, hi Anne. Name a species somewhere on the planet that is only in one place, one country, one place in one country. So endemic to one little area. Can you name one? All right, let's see how many we can get here. So think about it. The special, most special animals in one spot. Really gotta take care of those and let's see how far you get. All right, so while you are doing that, I wanna say welcome. It's so good to see people. Ah, tamarinds are my favorite animal, and I love whiskey. Me too, Ryan. All right, um, welcome everyone who's jumping on, especially people who came before and are joining us again, thank you. Oakland Zoo donors, friends of the wild, friends of Project Tamarin, friends of whiskey, friends of Cook and um, Savage and Cook Distillery, um, Wildlife Conservation, Network. I hope you guys are here. Oakland Zoo, hope you're here. Um, my mom and dad, maybe. Who knows? I'm glad to see you here. Maybe there's some monkeys with us, too. All right, let's talk about our guest. Our guest is Rosamira Gann. Rosamira Gann. She is the executive director of Proyecto Titi, and she's a pretty amazing person. So I know her well, but I Googled her for kicks, and all these awards start like popping up. There's, what is it? Oh, the Whitley Award and Nat Geo Awards and Fulbright Scholarship. So I'm not the only one who thinks she's amazing. She does such good work in the world. Um, her passion for cotton top tamarinds brought her from one career down a path to a whole nother career, just following that monkey passion, which we all love to hear. Um, she has pretty much changed the minds of an entire country about how they feel about this critter. So I'm blown away and I'm so glad to welcome, I'm gonna find her. Here she is, Rosa Mira. Hey Amy, yeah. hey. hi everybody, so good to be here. Yes, hello, and hello. this is for the first time we're really talking to somebody out there, um, out there in, Colombia, and it seems like you're so close. So how's it going during this crazy lockdown COVID for you, Rosemira? It's going, Amy, it's going. We have kept everything going, fortunately. Uh, our team is great. Uh, they are adaptable, just as the monkeys we work to protect. And we have been able to manage to continue doing our conservation work. Uh, as much as possible um, and adapt our programs to these new conditions. So we'll moving ahead. All right, I love that. <laughs> and I know that um, you've got, like at home, you've got a student at home sharing space and going to school from home as well? I do, I have my little tamarind here. Well, not that little anymore, she's 15. So <laughs> it's a big one now, <laughs> but yes, we're sharing sharing uh, home internet, computers, and the fun stuff. I love it. When I was talking to you earlier, you were talking about um, working from home and that you were doing a presentation and a mariachi band just appeared outside. <laughs> yes. your so we're kind of a mariachi band, right, everybody? If that happens, yeah. we're going to go with that. It happens. No, I'm probably not at this time, but it has happened quite a few times. And I'm, I'm so happy that everybody's really tolerant and understanding of <laughs> the current situations we're living so we're all being cool about it <laughs> i know we are so if you see a cat yeah. or something run by my screen yeah, that, no no worries well maybe a monkey maybe a monkey oh um, <laughs> i mean how like how, oh, are you yeah we both have our <laughs> um, be jumping around here. everyone where i'm from knows that it's just been an insane red sky day here today a little scary we kind of wish we were all with you how's it over there 
It's well, it's uh, it was actually a quite a sunny day, but this is the start of a rainy season, so we're going to be getting a lot of cloudy, not red skies, but brown. Oh, I'm not brown, sorry, gray, dark gray, and lots of rain, which is good for our tamarinds and for our forests. But yeah, I'm, I was I was amazed to hear your story about the red sky in California. That's very weird, isn't it? Wild, yeah, wild, wild. really wild. <laughs> All right, well, now we get to get our minds off of it. So I love this picture of you. Um, you just look like you're so in your elements. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you've just had such an interesting path to get from where you started to being this executive director position. Can you just, just give us a little background on your path? <laughs> well, my path started as an architect. I uh, was big time into design and I loved, you know, like bioclimatic design. So designing buildings and spaces that people can enjoy, but they would respect nature. And that led me to get a master's in landscape architecture in the U.S. Um, and uh, and I, I learned a lot about environment. I was fascinated by everything that had to do with environmental planning and environmental conservation. And, um, but uh, I was big time into landscape design. But when I came back from uh, from the U.S. to Colombia, my first job was redesigning the local zoo, the Barranquilla Zoo. <laughs> and that is when I first uh, cut and, uh, met Cotton Top for the first time in my life. And uh, that from then on, you know, it, it was the beginning path of the conservation career that it's already been 20 years working, oh um, working with, uh, with the protection of Cotton Top Tamarins you know, first from the zoo, as the zoo director, I ended up, don't ask me how these things happen, but I was a landscape architect for six years and then I was appointed as the zoo director. And then that was seven more years and that's when I met Anne and Proyecto Titi and fell in love with the species, with the project. And it's been 12 years already, full time, uh, pushing this boat and getting cotton tops on everybody's agenda here in Colombia and around the world. It's amazing. I mean, I love hearing stories of people following their passion. <laughs> they just do amazing things because of something just struck their heart. Yes, parks it. I, I saw a little bit of this on your website that I loved. Um, and it just says, we envision a world where the citizens of Colombia live in harmony with nature and ensure the survival of the cotton top tamarind and the rich diverse, diversity found in this world. And it's such a it's such a, a visionary statement, and um, it's it's so great to read and be part of. This is the kind of balance and the kind of impact that we that we dream for and that we work for every day. So I want to get a picture there of cotton top a couple cotton cotton top tamarinds. I know that your motivation was because you just sort of fell for them. And tell like what tell us a little bit about. <laughs> well, you know it it's such a cute, unique little monkey. I'd never seen a little monkey in my life before. And I saw this guy with a white chunk of hair, you know, just beautiful, all free stuff. And, and then I learned that it's only found here in Colombia, in this very little piece of the northern region of Colombia, where I am from, where I was born and raised. But I could not believe that growing up here, going to school here, going to college and everything. I never heard of cotton tops. I never saw uh, one. I never was taught in school about this, this animal. And I said, how can that be possible? If it's such a jewel of our biodiversity and our regional biodiversity and our country's biodiversity, why doesn't anybody know about this? And that, I think that was, that, that shocked me really hard. And when I had the chance uh, to build a new exhibit, for them at the zoo because they were on a very ugly little uh, cage and, and we had to build this nice exhibit. Then that's when I had to do some research about the species and that's when we connected with Proyecto Titi, which uh, Anne Savage was uh, leading. And, and then it became that strong connection. And then when I was a, the, 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 the zoo director, um, I, you know, I made the decision, it's like, this is gonna be our key species. This is gonna be the species that we're gonna teach kids about that we're going to do campaigns for, that we're going to, you know, work to support the, the work of Project TTT in the field, the research, the community work, education work. And that's when, you know, when the love relationship started. <laughs> it still lasts, it's still going. <laughs> it's incredible. 
Um, and yeah. with what um, you're out there doing research about families and all kinds of things, like what is unique about their families? Well, how, how cool and how similar to us humans they are. Mm -hmm. So for once they live in family groups, so it's mom, dad, and the kids, you know? Uh, and then when the kids get to be juvenile, you know, teenagers, they either get kicked out of the house, like some of us do, or uh, they leave. They leave and they go find a handsome or a cute uh, cotton top to make their own family, find, find their own territory, and make another cotton top family. And I love how they have a whole language of their own, some lots of more than 30 vocalizations they communicate, and how you can learn to. Uh, understand what they're saying, you know, by our team goes every day to the forest. So, oh, they, they know what they're talking about. So it's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, they're nervous. Oh, they're curious. They're angry. They're lazy, you know, <laughs> just because of the way they communicate, just observing on, observing them on, on, on the wild, in their trees, doing their thing. Um, and I also loved, and I thought it was so cool learning, you know, how good they are for the forest because, they feed from fruit, they swallow the whole fruit. And when they move around the forest and poop, then all these little seeds come out ready to germinate. So little trees uh, start growing. So as they hang out in the forest, they're also reforesting or restoring their, or keeping their own habitat healthy. I, I thought that was, I mean, I, it, it just, it just nature you admire how everything can just fall into into you know falling together nicely and each each species has a role and i thought the role of cotton tops was very important uh and the yeah, babies learn everything from their parents as we do they're very territorial so you know we don't welcome unwanted visitors to your home <laughs> that's just the way they are so i guess it's it's nice to connect and and to understand but it's also very powerful tool for education, especially with kids, mm -hmm. because the, the concept of the family is a very strong concept for us humans mm -hmm. and that it helps us have the kids connect to why it's important that cotton tops stay in the forest with their families, helping the forest stay healthy. So all, all of those things I thought they were very cool, very important and, and worth knowing and communicating to other people. Ah. It's amazing. <laughs> I don't know about all you guys. Maybe do a thumbs up or a, something to express how it feels when you know that seed dispersers, that every single animal has a role to make the ecosystem work. It's it's so beautiful that yeah. for that's why someone many of us are just we feel compelled to be part of this and to keep yeah. it. But that's amazing. I mean, those are some yeah. Those are extremely important. <laughs> All right, we're all falling for it. We see. <laughs> ah. Look at those babies in that picture. I mean, twins. look at them. Yeah, twins. Once a year, the fe oh. the dominant female has twins, and they hang yeah. out in their backs of every all of the adults. Everybody helps care for them, so you know. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, all right, so now we're going to go to the not fun part. But we always do this right before we start drinking. So there is a formula that works for us too. So, you know, you got involved because there were some issues. And I want to just let everyone know. I mean, we can guess some of the issues. They're common mm -hmm. all over the world. But um, your solutions are so amazing to reflect, you know, to help these conditions. So let's talk about them a little bit, such as this. Yeah, that's a sad image, uh, Amy. A main threat for cotton top tamarins, just like you said, as for many other species, especially primate species, is the forestation. Um, the forestation caused by urban development, basically human activities, economic activities, development, basically. Uh, habits that are not that friendly, such as slash and burn, sometimes get out of hand and wipe off more of the forest than we want. And you can see in the background of this image how the forest is back there. But all of that, uh, all of that, you know, deforestation brings something else that we call fragmentation. So basically you see uh, open areas in between forest fragments. And for species like cotton tops, that never comes down to the ground, 
Mm. That this is terrible. This is a huge problem for their genetic viability, for their uh, you know uh, a possibility to find resources such as food or shelter or new territories or new families. So fragmentation is a huge, huge problem that is created by unplanned uh, use of the land or changes in the land use. And of course, the logging and uh, cutting of trees, using the wood for you know, construction or firewood, or also for just selling for the big uh, companies that use wood for their products. Got so, it. yeah. Um, I like this question I'm gonna pull up from Nicole. Um, asking how big is one family's territory? Because if they have to leave a territory and get somewhere else, yeah, there's no way to get across. Yeah, on on our experience, it it it, it actually depends on the size of the full fragment of the forest. So the more forest you have, the larger the territories can be. In the places where we have studied, uh, the tamarins has been anywhere between five to ten hectares up to twenty hectares per family group. In a family group, it's usually between five to seven individuals. It's also conditioned by the size of the territory. So larger groups are in larger territories and smaller groups are in small, smaller territories. So uh, yeah, it is conditioned by the size of the forest fragment. And, but the more forest, the more area that they have for their daily living. All right, so it might look kind of tiny, but this is Okay. A lot of cows. Cows. <laughs> cows, cows, uh, cattle ranching and agriculture are, are the two main drivers of deforestation in northern Colombia. It's the activities that are very typical. The soil is very fertile for growing many things. Warm weather all year round um, and lots of pasture for cattle. Uh, we eat a lot of meat here. <laughs> so a lot of cattle is produced and unfortunately traditional cattle ranching is just wiping off everything and actually the uh the uh traditional uh, cattle ranchers uh the uh the, the the more open the land full of pasture is the beauty you know the more beautiful it is for them <laughs> so changing that mindset it's it's a challenge on its own but yeah, yeah those those are the things that are driving deforestation in northern colombia down to hmm, less than 8% overall, but for cotton tops, it's about two, 3% uh, viable forest for cotton tops that have the trees that they can use for food and for shelter. So it is pretty dramatic, unfortunately. Wow. And on top of that. <laughs> and on top of that. And on top of that, we have the pet trade. Mm -hmm. Such a cute, just cute, beautiful, unique animal that nobody used to know. And everybody thought it would be cool to have uh, a cool looking primate, a rock, you know, rocker looking primate, that hair. And it's been a, it's been a, a fight against uh, keeping cotton tops as pets mm -hmm. and uh, a traffic of these animals as a source of income for local communities. I read that long ago they were also used in, in testing, like they were pulled from medical testing. Yes, that was the beginning of of uh, of of the you know like like a, a, the big first impact for cotton top tamarins. It was in the sixties and seventies. There are bi bibliographies says that anywhere between thirty thousand twenty to thirty thousand cotton top tamarins were exported from Colombia to the U.S. for biomedical research, and that was related to colon cancer. So it seemed like uh, cotton tops developed uh, co colon cancer spontaneously. And they were uh, expecting to use them as, uh, as a bio, you know, for biomedical research to treat uh, colon cancer. But that, that never led anywhere. And then that's how, um, you know, cotton tops ended up in uh, many zoos all around the world, actually. And they're a very popular uh, zoo animal yeah. because, because they uh, reproduce in captivity and they have uh, stayed in, in zoos. But there are ambassadors for the ones here in the wild, so that's a good thing, I guess. Spread the word for the monkeys here in the in the forest. Absolutely, we do, we 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 do we work hard to do that. Absolutely. 
So Sean Paul asks, um, do you have any numbers on how many cotton top tamarins are currently in the wild? Yes, actually, a big part of, of our research work uh, focused about uh, 15 years ago on doing the first population census or survey uh, because there wasn't any numbers beyond that bibliography that said that 20 to 30,000 were exported, uh, but there was no numbers. And then um, a Project TTT developed uh, uh, a method to you know, reliably count monkeys uh, in the field. And it was all uh, a whole analysis of, of whatever was left in the forest and using uh, a transect and a long call uh, to be able to count animals and not, you know, not underestimate or overestimate the populations. Mm -hmm. So we did that. Uh, we have done that twice. Mm -hmm. We're getting ready to do it a third time. So our last count was about 7,000 uh, cotton tops in the wild in Colombia. And uh, the number in itself may not say that much. What really you know, shocks us all is the fact that the forest is down to 2%. So if there's no, you know, it's a little forest, then little tamarind. So I mean, that's why, you know, we'll see later on how we're focusing a lot on forest conservation for Absolutely. the monkey. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so go ahead. No, I was going to say that we're getting ready to do our third uh, population census, probably in 2022, uh, okay. hoping that COVID allows. And uh, we will see on a 10-year period how things are changed. And hopefully, because of all the hard work that we've been doing in our work areas, we'll, we'll be able to see, uh, to see a difference, a positive difference for cotton tops. Thank you. Oh. Um, amazing. Um, I know the answer to Jan's question, is it legal to export them? No, no, <laughs> not. And no, it was banned actually be because of all that, um, you know, mm -hmm. massive exportation of cotton tops. It was banned. It was prohibited in 73, I think. Um, it was prohibited. They were declared endangered. And then later on, when we did our first population survey in, in, in 2006, uh, we had enough evidence and, and scientific based information to say that cotton tops were critically endangered. And they have been, thanks to our research work, you know, the IUCN and the Colombian government accepted that uh, hard data that we collected from the field and, and definitely agreed that it was a critically endangered species. So, no, it is not allowed. Yeah. That's good. Things yeah. happen legally, though, too. So I want to note that I love people like Lauren and Roseanne are asking questions about solutions. So how do you do the counts and how much progress is being made <laughs> Station, but we're going to get to that. <laughs> um, right now, we're going to throw out a fun trivia question, and then we're going to learn all about how to make the tamarind teeny. And the, the trivia question is, um, what does a cotton top tamarind do when it's a little mad and territorial and wants to show that it's really big? What do you think it does? You think about that while I tell you a little bit about Savage and Cook. So Savage and Cook is this amazing distillery in Vallejo, California. First of all, it's gorgeous. So go there on tour when you're allowed to go on tour again. It's wood and brass and it's magical. But when COVID hit and they knew people couldn't come on tours there, they switched strategy and started making hand sanitizer. They hired all these bar people who couldn't work, got them making hand sanitizer um, and really sort of dispersing it, selling it online, but dispersing it to people who needed it. And they are willing right now to disperse that hand sanitizer to first responders, fire victims, people who need it, and um, essential workers. So you reach out to Savage and Cook. Um, you can also buy their hand sanitizer and whiskey online. That really helps them. So I'm excited to learn more about them. I'm going to throw this text on the screen. And um, Rosa, Mira, and I are going to disappear, make ourselves a cocktail while we learn all about this amazing cocktail. So see you in a flash. Welcome to Savage and Cook. In honor of the cotton top tamarind, today we're going to show you how to make the tamarindini. Savage and Cook is a craft distillery located in the historic core of Mare Island in Vallejo, California. We were founded by Napa Valley native and winemaker Dave Finney. And Savage and Cook functions much like an estate winery. 
as we oversee all of the aspects of our production. We grow our own grains, we use our own spring water, and we distill our mash in our own three-story still. And when the whiskey is ready, we lay it down to rest in Dave's old vine wine casks, where they age in the beautiful bay climate of Mare Island. Savage and Cook is a favorite for whiskey-loving wine drinkers and a must-have for wine-loving whiskey drinkers. We are going to be making cocktails today in the lounge, which sits just above our distillery, so come inside. In honor of the adorable and serious-faced cotton top tamarind, we are going to be using the tamarind in our drink today. Tamarind juice is a favorite in Colombia where the cotton top tamarind is making a valiant last stand. And it's like a cross between a green bean and a date with a pod-like outer shell and inner seeds surrounded by a sticky and sweet, tangy date-like flesh inside. The best part about the tamarindini, well, Tamarind is widely believed to have many health benefits, and the most well-known being that it can help reduce weight gain. So enjoy this guilt-free pleasure. Here's what you're going to need to get started. To make your tamarind juice, just add a tablespoon of fresh tamarind to one piping hot cup of water and mix back and forth until the tamarind breaks apart. Then go ahead and strain that and let it cool. If you're gonna use tamarind paste, only use about a teaspoon per cocktail so it's really concentrated, and you can add that directly to the shaker. Now next, the tamarind, the egg white, is a key player in our modified whiskey sour. That's gonna make your cocktail light and creamy and help give you that foamy head. So go ahead and add one egg white to your Boston shaker. Next, we're gonna bring out the tartness of the tamarind, and lime actually does that perfectly. They, they really complement each other. So let's add in a half ounce of lime juice. And then we're gonna add in a half ounce of simple syrup. And don't forget your two ounces of burning chair bourbon. Put it all in your Boston shaker and get that ready to do a dry shake. So that just means no ice for about 10, 15 seconds. Now, at this stage, I set this aside and I get ready to get started on my optional cream garnish. So directly into my whipped cream charger, I put my simple syrup, my lime juice, my tamarind juice, and then two egg whites. I'm gonna cover that, shake it, and then add two NO2 cartridges to the whipped cream charger. And then I'm gonna set that aside because I'm gonna pour that cream into a, an empty coupe glass. I'm actually not gonna to top it. I'm gonna to top the cocktail over it when I pour it. So go ahead and cover that and then get back to your cocktail. So now we just wanna add in a very small handful of cubes. You don't wanna over ice your shaker. About four or five is perfect. Get your shake on for a good 20 seconds, and that will make this incredible emulsification inside your shaker. Then in a dry coupe glass, I put our infused cream, pour directly over through a strainer, and then if you need to, you can kind of clean up some of that foam with some of the foam inside your charger. So this is a tamarantini. We hope you enjoy. Thank you very much for supporting Savage and Cook, and we hope to see you soon. Amazing. Yum. <laughs> yummy, yummy. All right. So we are about to do a little toast for Rosemary, guys. Who's got a drink? Rosemary, where's a drink? I have a drink. My cup is not that fancy, but it is tasty. <laughs> um, cheers. So cheers to you. Um, <laughs> this is our toast. We say to taking action for wildlife. That's what we're all doing. To Rosamira, a big hug. Let's do this together now. Chug a lug. Chug a lug. <laughs> I have to work on my. Ah. <laughs> I to have a drink, and Joyce is like, they show their genitals. Oh, I forget. <laughs> so is this. Um, I need to work on my emulsification of the egg process. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you know it looked it looked beautifully on on the screen. Amazing, it did, it did. and they're so sweet. They were so yeah. excited, they're and amazing. I don't know if Savage is still on, but they were so excited that they're Savage. <laughs> and Cook and I know Savage. what a connection, um, right? <laughs> it was just too good. Oh, simplified version. Me too, Carol Wing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rosemary, what does a cotton top tamarind do when they want to scare off another one and look big? Their hair just gets all fussed up. Really? Really, really, really tight like that. 
And I think it's amazing because oh, yeah, yeah, this is this is true. I thought, I thought it was funny. Like I, I was telling you, Amy, that you know, it's like when I learned about this that they really get all fussed up like that, and I'm like, yeah, right. Like you look really, really bigger than that. <laughs> but <laughs> for them, it makes a difference, I guess. And oh, yeah. and they probably scare away other tamarins who has more fussed up hair than others, and. That becomes a challenge for them. <laughs> but yes, that's what they do. They stick up and, and try to become a little uh, stronger and fiercer, I guess, so for cute. their enemies in the forest. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so here we go. This is how you guys know so much. You do this incredible research. Yes. Um, I want you to just tell us all about it, but we already had a couple questions, like how often do you do the big surveys? Yes. Okay, the uh, surveys, the first one we, we did was on um, 20, uh, 2006, so 2006 and 2007, and that was the base of, uh, of, of, the, um, of the, the work that we did to classify cotton tops as critically endangered because that was very important to call attention and to um, raise funds for the project. Uh, but then we did another one five years after, so 2012 and 2013. And it, there was very slight difference between the numbers in, you know, in a short fi in five year period. So we decided for the next one to wait 10 years and, and, um, and let more time go by. And we're getting ready to do the third one. But uh, the images that you're seeing is our team in the forest every day. So we have uh, family groups of cotton top tamarins in the wild that we monitor every day. And the, the guy that you see on, on the image with the antenna, that's Felix, uh, who was the person that hosted Anne the first time she came to Colombia to study the cotton tops it, about 30 years ago when she was five, she says. So, and, <laughs> and Felix is still working with us. He's a, our senior uh, field assistant. Um, he is just dedicated his life to cotton top tamarind research and conservation. Uh, and then he's on the on the other picture with Francie, one of our uh, field biologists. So they go in uh, in the forest every day. They find each family group using the antenna and uh, with the signal that um, the daddy of the family group has a little transmitter, like a backpack. And that's how we get the signal, find the animals. They sit down, take notes. Uh, yeah, on the back, over here. Wow. So what, what are they doing? They write notes about, uh, you know, um, who's there, what are they doing, how much time they spend looking for food, or how much time they, you know, take a nap or play or groom um, or move from one place to another. And, you know, it's been 30 years studying cotton tops in the wild. So, yes, there's been a lot of knowledge. Uh, but the fun thing is that all of that knowledge that we have acquired so many years of studies has been used for their conservation, for producing education material, for engaging communities with, um, with uh, productive activities, with the forest restoration work we're doing, and, of course, general awareness and uh, that we do through our social media and through our events and marketing and uh, selling these community products that made the artisans in the local areas. And so it is information that has been used for sharing, you know, through publications in, in scientific um, journals, but it has been used for conservation and also for authorities to make decisions on what areas they need to protect that are key to cut and tap tamarins. So we're very happy that all of that information is being actually used for the conservation of the species. You That's the whole purpose of it. All right. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk more about solutions, but if any time you want to give Proyecto TT some love, this presentation is you know free flowing for everybody. Um, but the idea is we have other people who fall in love with the project, and there'll be a how to donate straight to Proyecto TT link um, right there in the chat. If you're feeling motivated at any time, um, this is all about them and all their great things they do. And it costs money. Like how mm -hmm. you bought land, how did you do that? Yes, this this was a, you know, an, a, a something that actually was a, a dream in, of, of everyone in our team because uh, the main threat is, is deforestation. So, you know, 
in order to find solutions, we need to protect the forest, whatever was left. And we have been doing that in, in, with different strategies. One of them has been working with the environmental authorities, uh, providing this information, you know, making a case for the monkeys. And we have been able to create four protected areas, public protected areas that add up to 13,000 acres, more or less, uh, in, in two of the states where we work. And we have also been able to purchase land to protect um, a forest. And there is about 650 plus acres uh, by a national park that extends the forest area for the monkeys. And, and then we have more uh, areas to, to study the monkeys in and more areas protected that, um, that are, you know, that have cotton top tamarins as a conservation target. So we're very proud of that. This is one of these basically recent, the work we have done in between five and 10 years, but it's been growing over the past few years and we're very proud and happy to continue to protect this beautiful place that you see in the images. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, one of those places you never want to leave. <laughs> so we can it, donate and it actually buys real land that then can never- can, Yes, that is one of the areas we raise funds for. That's amazing. Yeah. Purchase land, we are in the lookout all the time for opportunities and for funding opportunities as well to expand um, uh, this private reserve that protects uh, forest for cut and top tamarind and restore it too. Uh, these are farms that used to be cattle ranches and agricultural mm -hmm. fields. So we are turning them into full forest areas for the monkeys and of course for all wildlife that shares a home with the monkeys. So that's incredible. So it looks like you're planting here yes. or you're growing something here. For yes, you're we are growing. growing trees. And that is another way we have been able to use all of this knowledge we have learned over the years is what trees cut and tops feed from, what trees do they sleep on, or, you know, spend the nights and to stay safe. And we have this very cool project with the farmers. You know, all of these protected areas that we are securing for cotton tops are surrounded by little villages and, and small towns where there are farmers. And farmers by tradition just wipe off everything, burn down the land, plant their crops, and then next year do the same thing again. So, you know, we made a deal with them and, and decided to oh, agree on, on a conservation agreement, right? So the deal is they uh, set aside part of their land for us to build uh, forest corridors that can connect isolated forest fragments. It's like a highway between two islands for cotton top tamarins to move around, right? And for wildlife overall. Uh, and in turn, they get uh, seeds, um, uh, fruit trees, um, uh, honey, uh, honey harvesting, uh, poultry. Uh, some of them have a couple of cattle that they use for milk and for dairy. So we help them make their land productive. And in turn, they set aside a portion of land so that we can plant trees. So all of those trees that you see in the images are trees that we're growing in, in our nursery. We collect the seeds of the trees that cotton tops use for food and for shelter, grow them in, in our nursery, and then plant them with the farmers in the corridors. That wow. way, we uh, involve communities, uh, create benefits to these families to improve their income and their well-being and restore the forest. We love that project. It's a good I combination. Know. It's a good combination. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. And it probably took a lot of work to, to create good relationships with these people. That, definitely. No I, think, I think the key has been uh, being aware of their needs, being aware of the challenges they face. Yeah. They are not cutting trees and hunting animals because they're bad people. They're doing so because they need to survive, just like everybody here. And you know, in this, mm -hmm. in this, you know, everybody wants needs to survive, feed their families, and make a living. So you know, if if our our approach has always been finding ways for them to you know fulfill that, and and it, it receptiveness, it's always been there because they are grateful and they want to help now that they have their issues resolved or partially resolved so it's been a good it's been a good deal we've been doing this for six years already we've been able to um 
to restore about 500 acres of forest corridors, uh, benefit about 150 families to date. And our hope is to continue, you know, growing. It's like a spider web of forest corridors and forest fragments wow. that make a uh, continuous habitat for the monkeys and for wildlife. And it also protects the sources of water for people and the sources of food. So it's a good deal, I think. And we're making progress on that. So that's, that's that we're very excited about that. So that's protecting forest and restoring the forest, both at the same time. Incredible. Well, the fact that somebody like you is in a leadership position is it's pretty amazing. I mean, you've got the you've got the skills to communicate, you've got the skills to do research, um, and the skills to problem solve in that way and really connect with the community. I mean, that's a pretty unusual skill set. You've got it all. I got it, but I have a great team as well. <laughs> and, yeah. and you know, uh, you know, we, we work very well together. Everybody shares that passion and they mm -hmm. give their 200% of each one of them to their work every day, even if it's, you know, being an assistant and checking out on the monkeys or teaching the kids or working with the ladies for their beautiful artwork or with the farmers. So it's a, it's a nice team. It's, it's just a very skilled, committed and passionate team. And I'm very okay. thankful to all of them. So what's happening in this photo? Um, okay, we have Mr. Salvador there. He okay. is holding a fence post that we call Titi Post. Of Titi course, post. everything has Titi in it in our <laughs> community work and education work. Yeah, this was an idea that we started developing uh, to uh, reduce the use of uh, wood posts that are cut from the forest to do fences. So we um, came up with the idea of recycling plastic bottles or plastic waste from the communities and grinding them and they get melted in a manufacturer uh, here in the big town of Barranquilla and then we use them to fence the corridors. So you see uh, Mr. Salvador there holding a, a post that fences the corridor that you see behind the fence and you see somehow you see a cow up there. That's one of the reasons we fence the conservation area so the cows don't go in and eat the uh, the bottom area. So, uh, you know, we've been, we've, we have some we installed 10 years ago and they're there, you know, uh, wooden posts here in Colombia rot very easily with the humidity and the heat. But this, these guys are like, they last forever. So it's so been a, it's been a good thing. Yeah. So you're recycling plastic, you're making yes. it for something else, you're yes. preventing deforestation and protecting the cows and creating good relationships with the farmers. Well, yeah. I love this and I love that you can sponsor um, a yes. TT post if you want to. So that's, it's kind of a yeah. magical post. It's a way you can help is donate uh, TT posts and we have them manufactured and, and use them for all of our forest restoration work. All right, and you're doing lots of outreach. So I love that you're kind of getting them young <laughs> um, involved, you know, in a way that the other generations didn't have the opportunity. Yes, this is a this is one of the the activities that inspires us all because we have seen how it's so uh, kids are kids get really really excited about having this little monkey that only lives in this little corner of the world. It's Colombian as I am. I mean, I feel proud and I feel responsible. Yeah. about caring for them. So we work with elementary school children. The first thing we teach them is, what is a domestic animal? What is a wild animal? Just so they understand that cotton tops need to be with their families in the forest. Yeah. And that's yeah. where the family concept comes very handy for our education team. Because when they think about, you know, kids from eight, nine years old, think about not being able to be with their family or being in a different home they're like, oh, poor monkeys, they got to feel awful in our houses. You know, yes, they feel awful in your houses, leave them in the forest. <laughs> and then we work with the secondary uh, school kids, like the ones in the picture, and they, uh, they go into the forest, see the monkeys, and they have a semester-long program that teaches a little more information about uh, why it's important and how can they help, which is key to all of our programs. And then they work on, uh, we'd work on, on like a, ecological clubs or conservation clubs, and they do their own leadership um, projects. And we have been doing this for over 10 years, and we've seen already, we have a, a bunch of uh, mid, in their mid-20s, kids oh, yeah. in their mid-20s, that have decided to go to environmental school, 
that uh, are working in communications and they all think that, you know, cotton tops are the coolest thing and they become like the most amazing ambassadors to our work everywhere they go. So it leaves, it leaves, a, uh, it leaves a, a, a footprint, I mean, in their hearts for this little monkey. And, and surely, you know, we, we expect to measure that in the longer term, but surely a difference on not supporting or avoiding anything that damages cotton tops. And, um, Absolutely. and no matter what they do, if they become environmentalists or researchers or whatever, to, to feel that pride, um, that, that. Yeah, we have one of, one of the kids that went to school for communications and now he has a news, uh, he has a news segment on YouTube. It's called TT News. And he, he, uh, he's a reporter for his, one of the communities where we work. And he collects all the news and stuff. And in and, and, and the microphone has got an image of a cotton tub oh. and So, you know, so they become ambassadors to our work. Look at I these guys. These are the dance of the cotton tub tamarinds. Okay. <laughs> I love, you have some festival. And I just know that there's people dancing yes. in these outfits. like, And they know a specific yes. TT dance, right? Yes. It's called the day of the day of the TT. So the day of the cotton top. We celebrate it in August 15th every year. And this year we had to do it virtually, of course, but um, it's, uh, it's always a big celebration on a, on a stage where kids from the different schools we work on come with their uh, customs and their dances and their songs and they write up songs uh, to honor cotton tops. We have a big cake. They have, you know, lots of, you know, soda drinks or water and they play, they get prizes and they have a fun day with the community all around cotton top tamarins. And that's the kind of thing that has increased the awareness and the emotional connection, which is what you want to do to, to get to people's hearts so they care, mm -hmm. truly care. And when you care, you do something about it, which is absolutely what we, what we hope people do. For and to have so much pride. I mean, this is one yeah. of those species that is in one place in the world. Yes, yes. People are asking about native art. So I want to talk about these. Um, so you talk about it while I show mine off. <laughs> hey, beautiful. I know my Icomochilas, yes. Yes, we have a group of amazing artisans from the local communities. You see there, it's uh, Mer Mercedes and Claudia. And these are two of the artisans that make that beautiful eco mochilas. Those are made with recycled plastic bags that litter so much everywhere in the world. So we collect them before they go to the trash areas. They cut them into threads. They crochet beautiful eco mochilas, and we help them sell them all over the place. Uh, and you know, Oakland Sue and Amy have been amazing about helping us, uh, you know, spread the word about the eco mochilas. You can buy them online as well on our website. And these guys too, that are part of that group of artisans, they yeah. make by hand. And that's another way we try to generate an alternative income that um, can help them with their economies and with their families. And then that way we kind of engage them and commit them to help us um, protect the forest and the monkeys. So yeah, all of these beautiful products you can see in ProyectoTT.com. And um, we do have a stock in the US, so it'll be a domestic delivery if you're interested. So yeah. I have I to make the pitch. In the world of many totes, because I've loved this project for so long, they never wear out. And they are easily, and they're really tightly woven. So I've got a yeah. little one for my lunch, and a big one for the beach. And yes. they're like the toughest, prettiest, wild variety yes. of colors. And to know that they help, like this is the tote you want, and yeah. you're gonna get one of these. So a great way to, yes. to shop. We like to shop. It's exciting to get a package, a package that's good, um, that does something good. So let's shop, guys. Let's shop. Shop it out. So, yes, this is a great way. It's actually a great way to help the ladies that are committed. We have been working with them for a long time, so over 10 years or 12 years. And, you know, they have made an economy of that. They have improved their homes. They have, uh, you know, taken their kids to um, through school and actually a few of them through college. So it, it is quite impactful and it's an amazing way to work. And then again, for grocery shopping, the, the eco mochilas are amazing for the beach, for your lunch bags, 
So yes, do shop. Do shop. And, <laughs> um, and the, yeah, to know it's cleaning the forest, supporting the women, supporting the families, um, and ultimately uh, supporting the cotton top tamarinds. Yeah. That's yeah. We love these eco pills are amazing. And Marty says those have been a big hit. Um, and my family and friends and mine too. Um, and I, you know, in, in the zoo, we've got like maybe four of them left to sell in our department. And we have to keep them on lockdown because they're desirable by other staff. Like we can't even keep them. No, these, these ladies have really, have really come a long way from when they started doing this eco mochilas. Now, actually uh, here locally, there has been uh, like two, three fashion designers that are working with them and you know making new models and combining the plastic crochet with you know with things like uh like uh metal rings or acrylic uh, uh you know just beautiful stuff and you know so they're now they're really uh fashionable and they're very fancy these ladies yeah <laughs> amazing and, you know, just the pride you know yes. they're artists yes all right, so we're gonna, um, Pam Arata Crichton says, mochilas for everyone. I don't know if she's offering to buy all of us one or she just says, we should all get one, but I'm due for more for sure. Excellent. Well, we, we're kind of, we're closed and we got about four more minutes, but I wanna really show people ways they can help and the way that um, your dollar can really count, whether you at the end of this are just gonna be you know, a fan of, Proyecto Titi, or you're going to buy this cute little monkey, um, or um, a few eco mochilas, or just donate. I love that fifteen dollars for one of the Titi posts. A fence post, um, yeah. Your post is going to live in Colombia <laughs> and help farmers and the forest and these monkeys is pretty exciting. Um, I love that 150 um, has all these workbooks for children and 300 um, really supports a field assistant. And you had another idea too. Um, what was it? Trees. Trees. One dollar, one tree. You a can dollar. help us. You can help us grow trees. We plant about 25,000 to 30,000 every year. We grow them in the nursery and plant them in areas that we want to turn from pasture or from agriculture fields into forest. We need to monitor those trees. We need to make sure they grow and become healthy forests for cotton tops and wildlife. Uh, so yes, you can donate $1 for one tree or you know many dollars for many trees. That all adds up to our work and helps us continue. We have a long way to go. We've done a lot, but we have a long way to go with the forest and we need your help on that. So especially I because i want i want to point this out we i know we talk about cotton tops because this is our you know beloved species and but basically saving the forest for cotton top tamarins you're saving the forest for so many amazing wildlife species that share a home you know there's macaws there's ant eaters there's sloth bears there's uh small ocelots there's you know boa snakes and all sorts of amazing creatures and plants that live in this forest and that save the water sources and that provide better climate for people in, com in the community and for the wildlife. So it is a whole ecosystem we're trying to save and cotton tops are helping us do that because they're so cool. So thank you. <laughs> I can just imagine, I mean, it's been a rough day for us in the Bay Area, but to think I could be responsible for 25 or 100 trees with a donation would just kind of really turn around my day personally. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, you turned around our day. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, it's just been such a pleasure and an honor and this drink is delicious. So I've got like the perfect <laughs> buzz and I feel way more hopeful about the world. Um, Amy, I, I wanna say, I wanna say that I'm very thankful well, to you for sure for so many years of friendship, but to the Oakland Sioux, you know, you guys have been our partners for a long time. And I loved every time I came to the zoo to visit you, to talk to you, to share updates. I miss that, but I'm sure we will be there sometime soon. But just want to express my gratitude on behalf of everyone in our team and of Cotton Talks because it's made a difference for us. It's allowed us to get all of these programs going 
and move forward on our, you know, hard work every day to save the monkey. So thank you guys. And thank all of you who support the Oakland Zoo and that hangs out today with us to listen to all of these stories. So <laughs> thanks to you guys. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we're all getting on a plane and heading over there now. So you'll see. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> come on, come along. Stay safe, Stay safe, everybody in California. And you too, Rosemary. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>